Welcome everyone back to this course on interactive theorem proving. And today we have a guest lecture about uh, the theorem prover Agda. And I'm really happy to have uh, Jeremy Seek here giving this presentation. So Jeremy's got a long experience in, in theorem proving. He's been working a lot in Isabel Isard before, but he recently switched to Agda. And I think he will tell us more about that now. So very welcome. In some sense, the main takeaway from this guest lecture is to explain sort of why I switched to Agda uh, from, uh, from Isabel. Um, and, and, sort of the, and sort of to show you the killer app, uh, at least for me as a programming language researcher, what's the killer app for Agda and for dependent types in general. So I could, I could sort of care less about vectors or fixed size lists, which is like the typical thing that people like, oh, dependent types, you know, you can do this. And, you know, I don't care about those things. So for a long time, I, I didn't really care about dependent types. But, um, but then more recently, I, you know, I found an application that I do care about a lot. And so I'll, I'll tell you about that. Um, so just a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a professor at Indiana University, Bloomington. Uh, uh, like uh, David said, I do research on programming languages. Uh, in particular, I invented gradual typing with Wally Taha. That was back when I was doing a postdoc at Rice University. Uh, what I do here at Bloomington is I teach, I teach both some undergrad and graduate courses. I teach the data structures course to undergrads. I teach the compiler course uh, to the grad students. Uh, I just recently published a book uh, called Essentials of Compilation uh, that has our own sort of uh, flavor of how we teach compilers here at Indiana University. And it's neat to see that that, um, that book is starting to get used in other universities as well. There's probably about 10 different universities that use it now. Um, so that's been a really fun thing to do. Uh, and yeah, in particular about proof assistance, I've been using proof assistance now for almost 20 years. Uh, and indeed, initially I used Isabel. Uh, in about 2019, I switched uh, over to Agda. Uh, initially, I was just for fun learning a new proof assistant. But then uh, after a while, I, uh, I sort of learned some uses of it that uh, kind of have me hooked now. Um, and um, you may have heard of this Programming Language Foundations in Agda book. Uh, it's, it initially started as like trying to do the Software Foundations book that you're familiar with in Coq, trying to redo it in Agda. But it, it ended up sort of getting more and more different from Software Foundations. Uh, and anyways, there's a, a part three of that book I wrote. And that, that section of the book is about denotational semantics. Um, so uh, yeah, so, but today we're gonna to talk about Agda. So what is Agda? Well, it's a pure functional language with dependent types and you can use it to create formal models and then prove properties about those models, okay? Uh, so that's, you know, pretty vague, uh, but we'll get into some, you know, a few different examples of that. Uh, and I know that, um, I know that you recently covered the Curry-Howard isomorphism, and Agda really embraces the Curry-Howard isomorphism. Um, it really, when you're when you're doing proofs in Agda, you can sort of put your functional programmer brain. You can turn your turn on your functional programmer brain and pretend that you're sort of just writing functional programs in a sense. Uh, and so, hopefully, I, you'll see a little bit of that as we go along. And uh, definitely uh, feel free to ask questions on the chat. I'm actually, I'm just remembering now to open up that window so I can see um, if you have any questions. I don't have a huge number of slides, uh, so definitely have time for questions. Um, and we're gonna be going kind of slowly through some uh, interactive stuff as well. Okay, so, um, what is, you know, let's first talk about, okay, Agda is a, a functional programming language. So it has a lot of the things that you would expect in a functional language. For example, you can do, uh, you know, you've got algebraic data types, right? So here we've got a definition of the natural numbers, okay? 
you know, you've probably all seen, uh, you know, seen something like that. And then uh, also we've got singly linked lists. Okay. Uh, and there's no dependent types here yet. Uh, we're just, you know, we're just defining some constructors for our, for our types. And of course, these things are, can be recursive, right? So you can have the successor of a natural number and get out and, you know, and that produces another natural number. Okay, so you've got your data types and then you've got recursive functions, okay? And so the first one I'm, I'm defining here is append. And one thing to notice about Agda is it has support for infix operators. Okay, so I'm defining this plus plus operator as an infix operator with a certain uh, precedent level. And then here I'm defining the append function. Now, maybe the, okay, so these arrows here are your normal function arrows, okay? Um, and so here we've got two lists producing a list, but um, this first parameter is maybe a little bit different uh, from what you might be used to. You know, we're trying to express the fact that this append function is polymorphic, right? But we're, but we're not gonna do it with sort of your typical generics, okay? Sort of Agda doesn't have that. Um, it has something in some sense more powerful. Um, and basically what we're gonna do is we're just gonna have another parameter here that just happens to be a type parameter, okay? So otherwise it's a, a fairly normal parameter. And so this set here, that's, that's how you say that something is a type in Agda, okay? So, so when you see sets with a capital S, just think to yourself, oh, that's a type. So A is a type. Okay, so that then makes sense to say list of A, list of A, list of A, okay? The other thing to notice here is that we've used curly braces, okay? When you use the curly braces, that means this isn't a normal parameter, an explicit parameter. Instead, it's an implicit parameter. And so when you have an implicit parameter, at the call site, you don't actually have to explicitly provide that parameter. Instead, Agda will figure it out uh, for you. Okay, so for example, uh, here on the second line of append, um, you can see that we're applying append recursively to XS and YS. And, and we're not providing the, the A parameter in that call, right? That's being, it's implicit, it's being figured out by Agda. And it's figuring it out from the other parameters, the XS and the YS, and it's doing some sort of pattern matching uh, to figure that out. Okay, so the curly braces is for an implicit parameter. Okay. And uh, then the other thing we should sort of talk about is termination. Um, Agda, it requires all functions to be terminating. Okay, so you, you just can't write a non-terminating function in Agda unless, you know, maybe you do some co-induction or something. Uh, but, and then you've got a different sort of things that you have to do to make sure that the co-induction is, is well-formed. But here we're doing, uh, we're doing induct, you know, we're just doing normal recursion. And what, and Agda is happy with this function definition for append because uh, it's seeing that the first parameter here is getting smaller, right? So we're going from X, you know, cons onto the front of XS and then in the recursion, we just have XS. So that's just normal structural recursion. And so Agda is happy with, with this uh, definition. Agda can handle uh, some various forms of recursion it can, um, um, automatically. That's it's pretty flexible, though sometimes you it doesn't handle it automatically, and then you have to use a special library for defining sort of general recursive functions, and then you have to prove your own termination uh, argument if you want to do that. And that's kind of a pain in the neck, but it is possible. Um, here's a, another, you know, fairly typical, um, you know, function uh, for, you know, on lists, functional programs. So here's the reverse um, of a list. And this particular re list reverse function uses append. 
Okay, so it says, okay, how can we reverse adding X to the front of a list, XS? Well, we can reverse XS and then put X on the back. Okay. Okay. So that's append and reverse in Agda. So fairly sort of normal functional programming, except for the way we're dealing with type parameters. Right. And those are just, they're basically, you can have your normal parameters can be type parameters. Uh, and this is where you're starting to feel a little bit of the dependent types come into play. And then here we just happen to also make those implicit parameters. We didn't have to, but oftentimes you do want to make the type parameters be implicit. All right. Any questions? Um, okay. Oh, David's got a question here. Can the argument for implicit parameter always be inferred? Um, the answer is no. Sometimes it fails to infer the parameter. Uh, there's sort of a somewhat nasty error message that you get uh, when that happens. Uh, and then you can then supply the, you can do an explicit, you can explicitly supply the implicit parameter um, to sort of, to help out, you know, Agda figure out what's going on. Uh, so that is a little bit of a, annoying sometimes. And you have to be, you have to be a little bit careful about how you use these implicit parameters um, to avoid those kind of situations. Uh, so yeah, that's a good question. Okay. All right. So, so right. You've you've learned about uh, a little bit about the Curry Howard correspondence. You know that types correspond to propositions. You know that programs correspond to proofs. And uh, you may or may not yet have seen that recursion corresponds to induction. Okay. And so we're going to be using, and you know, in Agda, we're really going to be using this Curry-Howard correspondence because in some sense, Agda only gives us types, programs, and recursion. And then we just have to use those to sort of mimic propositions, proofs, and induction. Okay. So, so we really only have the stuff on the left. And, but it's, it's sort of in a, such a way that's powerful enough that we can do all the proofs that we typically want to do using that. So let's kind of see what that looks like. Okay, so, um, so let's just start off with maybe one of the most basic things is, you know, how can you define relations uh, in Agda? And right here, where this is sort of already, you're going sort of beyond what you would normally see in a functional, just a, just a functional programming language. Okay, you, you know, you, functional languages typically don't let you define relations per se. Um, but here in Agda, you can define relate, you can sort of use your data type definitions to define relations. Okay. And, and this is where dependent types come into play. Okay. So, so here, what we're about to do is we're about to define equality, which is this funny triple. Uh, triple horizontal line symbol, okay? And if you've heard of th that there's different kinds of equality independently typed languages, you may have heard that there's propositional equality and, and definitional equality. Here, what we're talking about is propositional equality. But if you haven't heard about that, you can just sort of ignore it and just say, okay, we're defining equality here. And so what's going on here is that we're, uh, this equality operator is going to take two parameters, two explicit parameters of type A. Okay, so we're going to have something of type A and then another something of type A. Now, this first thing of type A, we're actually giving it a name. We're, we're, we're actually saying, oh, X is, the, is this input of type A that's coming in. Okay, and we're giving it a name because we're going to refer to the actual element that's coming in, okay? And then also we've got this, like we've seen before, we've got this implicit parameter uh, where we're saying, oh, A has a type, uh, A is a type. All right, so 
right? So this equality operator, it's going to be, you know, it's it's a data type that we're, and it's a data type that has essentially three parameters to it. Okay, so, so that's defining a type. And then now we have to give constructors, of course, for this algebraic data type. And this particular data type is only going to have one constructor called REFL, short for reflexive, which says that that for any you know for any element x, x is uh, is equal to itself. Okay, and what's kind of strange here, and this is again where dependent types come into play, is that here we're defining a constructor and we're defining the type of REFL. So we've got our colon here, and so what comes after the colon is a type. Okay. And you know the type is like this inductive type, right? But this inductive type, you know, takes two things of uh, of type A. So we're we've indexed our type, or our type has arguments that are, in some sense, terms or or whatever elements of A are. Okay, so that's kind of the strange thing is get is that we've got a type whose whose parameters are not like types, but are are just values, in this case, the, the two x's. All right, so this maybe this is already a little bit mind blowing, uh, at least it is for me. <laughs> uh, maybe it's worth pausing for a moment to, uh, to take questions about that. I, I can just uh, ask a question here on the, the signature here, if you can clarify this uh, with the the two arguments that you have x colon a, and then you have colon on top of, of the other. It's like the type, it looks like a type of a type. Oh, it, um, but it's not, I guess, because it's a, an, an argument, if you could. Elaborate. Yeah, this is maybe funny, um, Agda sort of notational things, is that um, the way to read this is that um, it's saying that this triple equal sign is has a has a parameter, you know, of type A. It is or that it's indexed on type A, and then and it's sort of curried because then the result type of what you get from that is then a function from A to type. Mm. So think of this as, as curried that it takes, you know, this implicit or i mean it well it's really you know it's it first takes the implicit then it takes this x of type a and then the and then the result of that whole thing is then an, is a function that goes from another a to a set yeah i mean i guess the confusing thing is this first x colon a mm. is that you know you're allowed to say oh i'm having a parameter of my of my data type that's not part of the type of the data type. Because uh, the type of the data type is what comes after this colon. Hmm. You know, the, the colon A arrow set is the type of the data type. Right. So it so, could be- yeah, Maybe one other way to read this is like, okay, the triple equals is a data type with two parameters, an implicit parameter, and then this x colon a is the second parameter. And then, so, so those are the parameters of your data type. And then the actual type of the data type is, oh, I'm a function that takes an a and produces a set, which is, means a type. So we're gonna be sort of doing some theorem proving here in a moment. But here, let's try, you know, let's try some alternatives to uh, to this, so like, could I, you know, could I do that? Um, maybe, and then you know, maybe I would have to do something different down here to make that work. Uh, And then, you know, and then also other variations on this that you could do are like, like that. But 
I think all these other variations are going to, you're going to run into trouble then actually setting up the type for the reflexive. Uh, for the constructor for the reflexive one. But could you so. put a could you put a parenthesis now around the the last a arrow set? Would that give the same thing? No, like not that. No, around the a and then the it, there and then yeah. Well, that that just parse that's going to be equivalent. That's just going to parse to the same thing. Exactly. Good. Good. Uh, that, I, that's what I mean. It's just so that uh, my human brain can parse it. <laughs> so ah, the, oh, I see. Got it. Yes. <laughs> I, I thought I thought that's the for, a was just for human parsing purposes. Absolutely. Yeah, I I thought it was associated to the left, the a to the left first, and that's why I got. So this clarifies a lot. I think this. this yeah. Clarifies. Yeah. Good. Cool. Thanks. Actually, let's maybe just continue on here. So the next thing I want to do is, so now we're going to kind of start to going, kind of tr go into theorem proving land, okay? You got a question um, in, the, in the chat as well. Yeah. Uh, let me pull, I can't see the chat window, so I need to... Uh, I believe you get the same thing with inductive and cock, and you get situations where it works or does not, depending on whether the parameter is given before or after the colon, so to speak. Uh, this is a comment from Victor. So yeah, that doesn't surprise me that that cock would uh, would have some sort of similar interactions. Um, okay, so the next thing I want to do is to show you how we can prove some lemmas or theorems about equality, okay? And, and the way we're gonna do this is via functional programming. We're just gonna write some functions whose types encode the theorems that we wanna prove, okay? So, so like we're gonna define a function called sim for symmetric, okay? And its type is roughly speaking, going to be doing something like, well, if you give me a proof of X is equal to Y, right? And this is, you know, this is going to be a type because, you know, formulas are types. If you give me one of those, I'm going to produce, you know, a proof that Y is equal to X, right? So that's, that's kind of the, you know, what we want this function to, have, the type we want this function to have. Okay, now, of course, these X's and Y's have to come from somewhere, right? So, uh, you know, one option is we could just, uh, we could just have them as normal parameters, okay, of type, some type A. We want this to work for any, any anything, so we want, you know, X and Y of any type A. And then of course we need A to, it can't, that can't come out of anywhere either. Um, so this could be our type for symmetric, right? Right, and then now, right now I'm writing a function. I've got all these parameters coming in and I need to produce a result. Okay, so now um, what you're seeing here in green is called a hole in AGDA. And this is how AGDA sort of part of the way it supports sort of interactive, you know, theorem proving is that you can have part of your program be or your proof be unfinished and you need to fill it in. And so I've, and you just, you, you type, you just type in a question mark and then, um, and then you can tell Agda to process the buffer and it's con control C, control L tells it to process the buffer. And when it does that, it creates one of these holes in green. And then you can, um, on actually down below here, now you can see it, it numbers the holes. And so this is hole number zero. And it tells you 
what you need to fill in the hole with, right? And of course, we need to fill in the hole with a proof that y is equal to x, which corresponds to the return type of this function, okay? The other thing that you can do is you can go into the hole and do control C, control comma. And now what it's telling you is, okay, our goal here, again, is that we need to prove that Y is equal to X. It also tells us the types of all the in scope variables, uh, which correspond to the current facts that we know, okay? We know that A is a type. We know that X is a th entity of type A. We know that Y is an entity of type A. We know that X is equal to Y and that the this little X equal Y variable is a variable that, that contains a proof of that, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a little term that, that, is, is, that is a proof that X is equal to Y. Um, right, and notice that, you know, these, uh, again, that these arrows, you know, these function types are really being used as implication, right, as logical implication. Uh, and then, you know, our normal rules for introduction of implication are really just the same thing as, you know, defining a function, which is what we're doing here, okay? So what do we need to do to fill in this goal? Um, well, we, we need, you know, we've got something of type triple equals, right? And so there's really only one way to prove a triple equals, which is re with REFL. So maybe just like, okay, there's only one way to do this. So maybe we need to do REFL and let's give that a try. So I just did control uh, C control space, which is the, the shorthand for filling in the hole with, with whatever I just typed. And we got this error that says Y not equal to X. Okay, right? So here we are, you know, we're trying to prove that Y is equal to X and, you know, REFL doesn't like that because REFL only lets you prove things are equal to themselves. Okay, so what do we need to do? Well, let's look at the facts that we already know, right? So we know that X is equal to Y, okay? So that's this parameter coming in. Well, just like any good functional language, AGDA lets you do pattern matching on your input parameters, right? And when, you know, and when you've got a data type definition, um, you're gonna get, you know, you're gonna get a pattern, you know, you're gonna want a different pattern for every constructor, okay? Now here, there's only one constructor, which is REFL, okay? <laughs> so the pattern matching is gonna be really easy. It's just that the only possible thing that that X equals Y thing could be is a REFL. Okay, so we can just put in REFL, but now look what has happened. Our, you know, for one thing, AGDA has now figured out that Y actually has to be equal to X, right? So this is, this is you know, where is it, you know, we're going beyond what a normal functional language would do is that because of the way that this, type of this uh, constructor is written, that it only allows X equals to X. When we have the REFL here, we now know that the only way for that REFL to be, to be valid would be if X is actually equal to Y, right? So here we have this little notation down here that says, oh, we've now learned that Y is equal to X. And our goal is no longer y equals x because Agda figured out, you know, well, y is equal to x. So this is now x equals x is our uh, goal. Now, one thing I just realized that I've been doing in the last 30 seconds is I keep using the word equal in two different meanings. <laughs> There's the sort of meta equality, 
or Agda's sort of built-in equality, and I think this also corresponds to what you'd call definitional equality, uh, where which is this equality down here that we know that y is equal to x. Uh, and then the other equality is, of course, the triple equal. Okay. Uh, great. So now, now we need to prove that x is equal to x, and we can do that, of course, with REPL. So that's sort of a, a first a first proof in Agda. And it was really what it amounted to was writing a, a function. We just wrote a function. Um, and the sort of special thing about it is that we were able to do pattern matching on a data type that was dependently typed. All right. I'm gonna pause for a moment if anyone has Questions on chat, um, or also potentially if you wanna do an oral question, I suppose we could do that too. I, I can ask a question here. Uh, so, so maybe, so in Coq you're using tactics a lot. Um, how 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 does maybe you will come into that? Is, is there something similar in Agda, or how are you? Yeah, it's a good question. So for the most, if you're just using sort of normal Agda, you're not using tactics. You're you're doing what I've just done here. You're doing functional programming. <laughs> um, there are there are some fancier things that you can do in Agda. Um, that sort of get you closer to doing tactic like stuff, but those are no not used normally. Okay. So the normal mode of doing proofs in Agda is, is to do this more uh Curry Howard, you know, functional programming approach where you're where you're literally building the proof terms. Right. You do it very explicitly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's one thing that some people don't like about Agda is that you're you're not given as much automation sort of right off the bat as you are in uh, Coq. On the other hand, one of the challenges with Coq and with tactics is that your proofs are much less readable mm. by humans, whereas in in Agda your proofs do tend to be much more readable. Because it's sort of like you're 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 reading a functional program, and maybe related to that uh, readability. Because if we reflect back to your you know uh, knowledge about Isabel and ISOR, and especially ISOR that was designed to make proofs readable, uh, mm -hmm. how would you relate that in, in in readability? Yeah, so I think with Agda you can basically achieve almost the same level of readability as you do with Isabel. Uh, sometimes, I mean, there's some sort of stylistic choices that you make as you're writing your proofs. And so uh, you can make your proofs sort of unreadable mm -hmm. and you can also make your proofs readable. Like you could do the same proof in different ways. And part of the trade-offs are you know, one of the trade-offs is how often do you actually write out the formula or sub-formula that you're trying to prove? And the more often times you do that, the more readable your proof's going to be, but also the more verbose your proof, your proof is going to be. And so there's some, you know, some sort of choices as the person doing the proof that you make about readability. And you can sometimes even, you might refactor your proof. Like you might get your proof done and then decide, oh, it's not as readable as I want it to be. And then you go and refactor your proof to make it more readable. Uh, but I, I'd say Agda does give you the tools that you need to make your proof uh, as readable as it would be in Isabel. Uh -huh. Cool, thank you. And maybe that's part of why I like, I, I like Agda. Yeah. Um, 
Okay. Maybe the next thing I'll do is we're gonna, I'm gonna sort of build up to some sort of more interesting lemmas, uh, but I'm gonna do it very sort of ground up where I'm not gonna, like I could be importing a lot of things from the standard library, but if I did that, it'd be kind of magical. So instead I just wanna like plop down, you know, all the things that we're gonna use uh, to do some, some slightly more interesting proofs. So, um, another thing we're going to want to use is the rule for transitivity, uh, which is right there. Notice that I've made some slightly different choices in how I packaged up this function that I decided to use some more implicit parameters. Uh, and that's just for the sake of readability, of, of wanting more things to be implicit. And in fact, we're going to want to do that up here for this one, for, cement, for the sim rule. So this is just sort of cosmetic, you know, changing some explicit parameters into implicit parameters. And I can actually delete those and that works just fine. Okay, so here we just have the transitivity rule. If X equals Y and Y equals Z, then X is equal to Z. So that's all well and good. Uh, maybe this next one is something a little different than what you might have, what you might be used to. This is the congruence rule. And so what are we proving? We're trying to prove that if you apply a function, any function F, right? So we've got this function F, you know, from an arbitrary type A to B. And if we have, if the input to F, you know, we're gonna give the inputs X and Y to F, but we know that X and Y are equal propositionally. And what we wanna know is that the outputs of, of this are equal, which they should be, right? Because functions in Agda really are functions in the mathematical sense, right? There's no side effects or any other crazy stuff. And so if you call the same function twice on the same input, you should get the same output. And indeed, um, you know, we can, uh, you know, we've got our F coming in and then we've got our implicit parameters and then we've got our X is equal to Y. And so we can pattern match on that. And then, so down here in our goal, we just need to prove that F of X is equal to F of X. And that is fine for doing REFL, right? Because the X up here corresponds to, can be instantiated to be the term F of X on both sides. So we've got two of two I, syntactically identical terms on either side. So that's fine, we can do wrap all there. Okay. So this, and we're gonna use this congruence rule a lot to do sort of, um, to, to reason about things like lists. Okay, so then the next thing I wanna do is I wanna do a proof, some proofs about lists. Okay, so I'm gonna pull back in the definitions we had earlier about natural numbers and lists, okay? So we're just gonna be doing some proofs about natural numbers and lists. Again, these are things that would normally be, we'd use in the standard library, but I'm just sort of, I wanna show you uh, you know, I just want to have the definitions here so that there's no magic. All right, so here's, you know, we've got our natural numbers, we've got lists, we've got append, we've got reverse. And so we're going to spend the next, um, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, however long it takes to prove the following theorem, okay? That is, we need to define a function and the type of this function says that if we reverse a list and then reverse it again, we're going to get out the same list as what we started with. Okay. Uh, so this is a is, this is a super classic little theorem about lists that you could prove in any. Theorem prover. This particular lit example I got from the Isabel tutorial, 
Uh, it's a really fun little uh, uh, example. Uh, you could certainly do this in, in cock as well. Uh, and so, uh, so we're gonna dive into that. And, but again, you know, here we are in Agda. And so, you know, really what we're doing is we're just trying to define a function that takes a list and produces a element of this equality data type, right? We're trying to produce an element of that data type. Okay, so, so we're just, you know, trying to produce some data. Okay, so here's our goal. Now, okay, now here comes into play the part earlier where I said that, um, that induction is the same thing as recursion. Okay, so we're gonna try to, we're gonna prove this theorem by induction, but what that means is that we're really just gonna be prove, you know, we're gonna be writing a recursive function, okay? So how do we write recursive functions? Well, you know, the same way we wrote this rev function here is we, you know, we did some pattern matching on what are the different kinds of constructors for lists. Okay, there's two different kinds of constructors and then we're gonna do a recursive call in the body. So we're gonna do the same thing here for our, for this lemma. Okay. And so, so now we need to fill in, you know, the body for each case. And so this is the case for the empty list. And you can see that our goal is that we need to prove that the empty list is equal to the empty list. So maybe this is a good place to pause and someone could type in the, what they think is the answer in the chat. Raffle, yes, very good, Raffle. Right, we just had two things that were exactly the same syntactically, so we can just do Raffle. Okay, now for the harder one is we're trying to prove that the reverse of the reverse of X cons down to the rest of the list XS is gonna be equal, triple equal to X cons down to XS. Okay. Now, one thing I like to do whenever I'm, you know, doing um, this kind of, uh, well, whether I'm functional programming or proving, I like to go ahead and sort of put in the recursive call. Like I know I'm gonna make a recursive call. So I might as well, you know, put that in. And right now we're gonna, I'm gonna use a let, I'm gonna use a let binding. Um, and I'm gonna call it IH for induction hypothesis. And I'm gonna call, I'm just gonna do the recursive call on the smaller list, okay? And now let's look at the type of this IH variable. Ah, this IH variable, is a proof that if that the smaller list, you know, that our theorem is true for the smaller list. Okay. And now here's here's a readability thing. I'm going to take that type and I'm going to put an explicit type annotation on our variable to document the induction hypothesis. Okay. So this kind of goes back to uh, readability. Okay. And you see how I just sort of enhanced readability there by deciding to use a type annotation. Okay. Okay, Victor's asking the current view did some evaluation on the type in the goal, uh, but the previous view with just the whole did not. How do you control that? Uh, that's actually interesting. Uh, good question. So, well, here, let's, um, so down here, we're looking carefully at what is our current goal looking like. And if I go like this, you know, it was a much simpler goal. And the difference between uh, those two things is whether Agda unfolded the definition of reverse. Right here, we've got reverse applied to a list. 
it knows that reverse applied to this cons is gonna, you know, be this clause of reverse, okay? And then, you know, here when I have this let, oh, this is interesting. And now it's it's actually not showing the whole thing. But then when I do control C, control comma, it is showing the expanded, the expansion, which is the body of this, okay? And um, what's going on here is that these two different things, you know, the, the left-hand side of this and the right-hand side are, this is the definitional equality in AGDA. So AGDA, you know, considers these things to be definitionally equal, and AGDA will sort of willy-nilly apply definitional equality whenever it feels like it, okay? Or in some sense, you can see that it, it sort of always does, def, you know, always is applying definitional equality, but sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't print out the fully expanded version. Sometimes it tries to print out the not so expanded version. And then um, Victor's next question is, how do you control that? And the answer is, um, you mostly cannot control it, <laughs> which kind of sucks actually. Um, Though that's not a completely true statement. You can use some fancy features of Agda with this abstract keyword to do some controlling of it. And then you can also do, there's some flags that give you access to some experimental features of Agda that also let you control it. Um, but if you're just sort of doing vanilla Agda, the sort of basic AGDA, you're you're not really in control of when the definitional equality is being used. And you can, it sort of is being used all the time under the hood. And sometimes it's showing you the result of that and sometimes it isn't. And that can be problematic. Uh, and then Anders Thune asks, I suppose you can use type annotations to get the form you want. Uh, and that's true. Uh, that is absolutely true. That you can, if you want the unexpanded version, you could put that in a type annotation, and and Agda is going to be okay with with that version of the of the type with a less expanded uh, version. Okay, that's true. Or and maybe one way to show you that is. Like here's here's what we're trying to prove. And I'm gonna use this, I'm gonna call this need to show. <laughs> this is like what we need to show. Um and right here, oh, this is funny. You can see that the type down here that it's showing us for NTS is the fully expanded version, which doesn't actually match what I wrote, but that's, you know, that's okay because of Agda's point of view, these are all the same. Uh, and I could, I could just type in NTS there, and of course it's happy uh, with that. Okay. Okay, so here we are back at trying to prove that the reverse of the reverse is itself. We've got our induction hypothesis, which is just a, you know, we, which we just got by doing the recursive call. And, and now we've got our goal and indeed Ag has sort of expanded out uh, that inner call to reverse. And so now what we're dealing with is we need to show that, well, we've got this, append operator here, and then if we reverse the result of an append, we're going to get back to this over here. Um, so let's think. Okay, and then we know that if we do a reverse of reverse right away, we can, we can apply our induction hypothesis. So this, so we need to kind of think here. 
Um, I know in some of your earlier lectures, um, there were well, there's a little bit of a discussion of theorem proving as video game. And in some sense, what we've done so far is we've, we've just been playing the video game. You know, we did all the obvious moves here where it's like, oh, we have one input that's a list. We're gonna do recursion on that list. We're gonna fill in some holes with the obvious things. We're gonna do the recursion. Again, that's an obvious thing. Um, so we've been doing the video game, you know, and now we're now we're in this spot here where it's like, oh, can we continue sort of just doing the obvious thing? Or maybe uh, we're, we, we might be stuck. And when you're stuck, then you have to come up, let's, uh, you have to put on your thinking cap. You have to think a little bit. And one analogy I like to do is an analogy to um, open water swimming. Okay, I don't know if any of you are, are uh, uh, fans of triathlons or other kinds of open water swimming, but if you've ever watched them uh, swim, you'll know that, uh, that the, the, the swimmers will be, they'll spend some time swimming with their face either down or just very quickly taking a quick breath to the side. And of course, while you're swimming like that, you don't really know where you're going. I mean, you know you're roughly going straight and you're moving quickly because you're very efficient. So you're moving fast, you're making forward progress. But every once in a while, you need to double check that you're going in the right direction. So what you do, you do is you bring your head up and you look, you know, you bring your head up out of the water and you look forward to see where you're going. And I think that's a really good analogy for when you're doing theorem proving that, um, you know, you're going to spend some time just swimming along, doing the obvious stuff, but it's really important to periodically pull up your head and look where you're going and make sure that you're, where you're going sort of from a low level tactic perspective, I don't mean tactic, I mean a low level sort of theorem proving video game perspective matches up with like your overall strategy of where you're trying to go, okay? And so in, in one of the times when you obviously wanna sort of look at what you're doing and think more globally is when you get stuck. All right, so here we are, and indeed we're kind of stuck here because, you know, we've got this reverse of append and, you know, our induction hypothesis doesn't tell us anything about reverse of append. Okay, so we're, we're kind of in trouble. We really have nothing else to work with. Uh, so we need to stop and think. And so this is where we might start to think to ourselves, oh, wait a minute, do we need to prove some sort of lemma about the combination of reverse and append, okay? So like when you do the reverse of something, of, of, of two lists that are being appended, what happens, okay? Um, so this is sort of a classic thing you need to do when you're proving theorems. You know, this is something that mathematicians do all the time. And this is something that formal, you know, computer scientists do as well. And part of the hard part about you know, we need to come up with some sort of lemma, some sort of property about reverse and append. And the hard part is figuring out like what that, what really the statement of that property should be. So like one thing we might do, and in particular, we're, we're most likely going to need to um, generalize what it is we're trying to prove, okay? So, this formula here is way too specific, okay? There's sort of, you know, this is not gonna work as a lemma. So the idea is we're gonna have to take away some of the places where we're being specific and replace it with, you know, just arbitrary lists, okay? So for example, you know, maybe, um, you know, maybe we wanna sort of generalize away from having sort of an arbitrary, uh, you know, just a single element here to having an arbitrary list, okay? And then actually similarly, maybe, maybe you know, in the, the simpler we can make this lemma, the better, okay? So like if we can get rid of this rev here, 
um, that's going to be even better and going to be easy, even easier for us to prove. So now here we've got sort of something that's looking like it's really just about like, oh, how does reverse interact with append? OK, and so now we want to think to ourselves, well, is there something that we could put over on the right hand side that would be true <laughs> about reverse and append? What could we put over on the other side? And here I'm going to pause for suggestions. All right. Oscar says maybe we could put rev of xs and then rev of ys. Okay, and then, you know, a good way to sanity check is we could try doing a proof of a simple example, right? So we could have like, and then see if this works out. Right, so this is gonna give us two to one. And rev of three, four is four, three. And okay, Oscar's already um, saying, oh, maybe maybe Victor had it right instead. Um, I'm just gonna finish this off for, for posterity here. So obviously that was wrong, but it was darn close. So Oscar, don't feel bad. Um, uh, it's doing this kind of experimentation is part of the process. Um, and so, the right answer is that we want to instead, you know, flip the Y and the excess there, right? And if we do that, of course, now we're going to get rev of three, four, rev of one, two, and then that's going to give us four, three, one, two, oh, two, one, and then that's equal to four, three, two, one. Okay, so good. So now we have something that, at least on one example, works out okay. I, one thing I should mention is that, um, that sometimes people doing theorem proving, interactive theorem proving, uh, sometimes those we forget about the value of testing. It's very easy to forget about testing because you know, we, we end up being sort of snobs and, and sort of having this attitude of, well, testing can never prove that something's 100% perfect, right? Testing will only give you a little bit more confidence that something's right. And therefore, you know, oh, testing's worthless is sort of the, is the thought process that many theorem proving people get trapped into. However, I would argue that testing is very, very important, even if you're still going to be proving your theorems. Okay, improving complete correctness. And the reason why testing is so valuable is that testing is much less expensive than theorem proving. Okay, especially when what you're trying to prove is false, right? So like the, the theorem that we had here was false. And so there's just no hope of ever proving it. And we could have spent a lot of time trying to prove it, but it was much easier to come up with a counterexample. Okay. Um, now with these little these little theorems, the difference in time for doing testing versus theorem proving is not that big. Uh, so it's a little bit hard to believe me on this, but when you get to more complicated proofs where the proof might be several pages long or 10 or 20 pages long, then it becomes even more valuable that you test uh, those kinds of properties um, you know, which you can do really fast instead of, you know, writing out the 20 pages only to find out that what you're trying to prove is false. Okay, so with all that being said, let's go ahead and do this reverse append proof. Okay, we're going to do the, the correct one here. All right, so here I've just written out, you know, the, the lemma and I've added in the parameters 
Oh, this time I just decided to make the X and Y S as explicit parameters. I think I did that maybe because um, it might have just been an arbitrary choice, or it might have been because Agda was having a difficult time inferring those parameters. Uh, so, all right. So now we need to prove this reverse append property. And so let's go back into video game mode. We're just going to do this by recursion on the first list, the XS. Now here I can tell, this is kind of a slick thing you can do in Agdas. You can tell it that I want to do case analysis on the XS parameter and it will generate the patterns for me. Okay, so that's kind of cool. And then now what I need to prove is that rev of ys is equal to rev of ys with the empty list appended on the back, okay? And let's, uh, let's remind ourselves of the append definition here. David asks a question here, is there property-based testing in Agda, similar to quick chick in Coq. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I think the answer is no, which is terribly unfortunate, uh, given what I just said about the importance of uh, testing. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, who knows? Maybe maybe someone has recently created it or, or, um, or someone will soon. Uh, Okay. All right. So let's look at what we need to prove for this case where the where XS is the empty list. All right. We need to prove this. Um, unfortunately, this does not match either of these two cases, right? We need to be the first parameter needs to be the empty list or a cons. And instead we have rev of ys. So we're not going to be able to apply, you know, to unfold this definition of append. And we're kind of stuck here. Okay. So again, we're stuck and we're like, oh, you know, now we need we need another lemma, right? And so, you know, we need to, you know, essentially generalize this property that we're now trying to prove. Okay, so let's into something that should be easy to, to prove as a lemma. Um, so I'm going to pause here and ask for suggestions about how do we, what should we generalize to make this easy to prove, uh, this property easy to prove as a lemma. Any suggestions? Yeah, so Victor makes a suggestion that we prove that I'm going to say XS is equal to XS plus plus empty lists. So, right, this, you know, here, this is purely just a property about a pen that really has nothing to do with the reverse. So it's good to sort of forget about the reverse part um, and, and do that. And oh, by the way, I'm using the variable XS here. I'm going to be using sort of XS and YS sort of following Haskell sort of typical uh, or even Agda in functional programming style of using those variable names for lists. Uh, and, and we'll use X just for elements of the list. Okay. Um, okay. So we want to prove this property, which is this. You know, I'm gonna, now we have another lemma that we need to prove or another function we need to define. And now we'll go back into video game mode. We're gonna do what we always do is recursion on, you know, that XS variable, right? So we tell Agda to pattern match on it. Okay, now we can go into the first case and we need to prove that the empty list is equal to the empty list. Cool, we've got identical 
syntactic things on both sides of the equality. So that's a REPL. And then now we've got this to prove. All right, any suggestions about what we should do next? Maybe one way to think about it is it, should we stay in video game mode and do the next obvious thing in the video game or should we think? Think about it and <laughs> maybe prove another lemma or something. Victor says, do the recursive call. Yes, absolutely. So we need, in other words, continue in video game mode. Right, this is always um, what we always do. Okay, so there's our induction hypothesis. Let's uh, make this nice and readable and actually put the type there. I'm just gonna copy and paste it in. So the induction hypothesis tells us that um, that this, that if, that the sub part here, actually let's give a different name to this just to avoid confusion. So XS prime is the sub string or the sub list. Okay. Oh, uh, okay, Victor is saying, then could we pattern match to get the equality? Um, that's, I'm not sure if that would help or not. That's a good question, I'm not sure. Um, you know, I think we probably could maybe do that suggestion, Victor, but then we'd have to write the rest of our code in, what's called in continuation passing form, which is uh, it's a little bit too early in the day here for me to do that. <laughs> but I think that might, might just work. Uh, but there's gonna be a, a more direct way to do this, okay? And so um, this the next step, so what's going on here is that we need to prove this equality and and now we've got this, we've got some pieces, some subterms within our equality that are actually the, that we know are equal, right? Like this part here, right? That's the left-hand side of our induction hypothesis. And this part over here is the right-hand side of our induction hypothesis. So there's a rule or a lemma that we already proved that's gonna let us sort of take this last step. Um, and that rule is the conj rule, okay? So the conj rule says that if you have, if you know that X is equal to Y, then you can prove that F of X is equal to F of Y. And so the X and the Y, this equality here is gonna be our induction hypothesis. Okay, and then the weird part is that this F is gonna be the following lambda term, okay? Oops, wrong lambda. So um, the F is basically, it was everything around, it was like the commonality of the things that we're trying to prove. And maybe to let people see that again, maybe what I'll do here is, uh, right, I'm trying to prove this whole thing. Maybe I'll, but this is our 
you know, right here is our goal. Right, so the commonality is the little x colon colon, little x colon colon. And then what I've done is I've abstracted out the parts that are different using this, actually maybe let's say, call it y, so we don't have two x's running around, okay? And then the rest of the conj, like I said, needs to be, you know, the induction hypothesis there. And so now you can see that the, this need to show NTS is now exactly what we need to prove. So I can just go like that and we're done. And so um, maybe one thing I'll, I'll say is that in some other theorem provers, um, you wouldn't use this congruence rule. You might have a way of applying inequality as a rewrite to another formula, okay? Uh, Isabel has that capability. I'm, I would be, I'm sure Koch has, has a capability of like that. Uh, so does Lean. Uh, Agda does too with an, with an experimental feature that you have to you have to enable for rewriting. But without without that experimental feature, uh, you're kind of stuck doing this explicit conj business, which is kind of a pain in the neck to tell you the truth. Uh, so this is this is one pain point uh, with Agda, um, and sort of why why you know I I end up using that rewriting. Uh, feature, the experimental feature uh, in some of my larger work. But, you know, some some people don't like that rewriting and don't completely trust it. And I have gotten into trouble in the past with there being bugs in the rewriter uh, because it is sort of this new experimental thing. It has gotten better in the last year or so, but it's still uh, a little bit of a pain point there. All right. And then, you know, the way I would probably end up writing this I would get rid of that stuff and just do this. Um, maybe I'll pause there for other questions or comments about that. Those are definitely some sort of new new ideas using this conj and, and then using this lambda here. Uh, someone here is uh, giving a remark about controlling Agda's evaluation and that there's a shortcut that tells you, please show me the unnormalized or non-expanded version of the goal. So yeah, that's a good, that's a good one to know about. Control U, control C, control, is it comma? Uh, I guess it's the U for unnormalized. Yeah. Actually, so uh, Anders had a, a good point in the chat client here about sort of there's a, another feature of, of Agda uh, that you can use. It's, it's a little bit, I have to point out that it, this feature is a little bit restrictive and that it, it's sort of only, it's hard to do it in certain situations. But, um, and this actually gets back to something that I, that I think Victor was uh, suggesting earlier as well, is that, um, so there's this special with clause that you can do uh, in Agda. And then you, you can uh, essentially, you know, do something like, okay, I'm making a call to a pen nil and then pattern matching on the result of that. And when I pattern match on the result, you know, that's producing an equality. And then that equality gets, you know, the knowledge of that equality goes into sort of scope of what we're trying to prove. And then, you know, at that point, what we're trying to prove is just that the same two things are equal. Uh, so that's uh, when when you can, that's sort of a, a nicer way to do that. Um, uh, the dot, 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 that's just part of the sh uh, syntax of when you do a with clause, you, you put some expressions and then you're pattern matching uh, those expressions down here. And the dot, dot, dot is just, is just sort of 
Uh, it just has to go there. It's just part of the syntax. It doesn't have any independent meaning. Okay. Uh, good. So I'm going to, I want to get to uh, some programming language kind of stuff. So I'm going to kind of speed up here. I mean, I think we've sort of made the, the main point of sort of how you go about doing um, proofs uh, in, you know, proofs using sort of this Curry Howard sort of style in Agda. Uh, yeah, okay, so, um, yeah, I guess one thing, um, okay, back to the question about the dot, 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 is that the dot, dot, dot is a, it's, it's, it is indeed sugar for just restating uh, the function. And under the hood, what's going on is that the with clause, it's sort of like, almost like creating like a helper function that has more parameters that you can then pattern match on. Uh, if I if I understand correctly, how that's implemented under the hood. Um, though I'm definitely not an expert on, on anything regarding Agda's implementation. So uh, don't take my word for it. Um, okay, so then let's sort of finish off this reverse append uh, sort of quickly. So we've now, we finished append nil. So now we have what we need to, to prove this goal, except that it, we flipped the order, but that's okay. We, we already have, we also proved the symmetric rule. So now that fits the, the direction we have up a, above for append nil. And then we just need to do that for, a, what are we doing append nil to? To the reverse of ys, right? So we're done with that. And then for this reverse append part, you know, getting back to, okay, this next inductive case, uh, of course, we're going to want to invoke the induction hypothesis. So there we go. And then, you know, we're, we've got to prove this equality down here. And so, you know, a typical way to prove the equality is to like start with the left-hand side and make, you know, changes to it until we finally get to the right-hand side, okay? And so uh, one thing we can do right off the bat is we know that this part over here matches our induction hypothesis. So we can go ahead and apply the induction hypothesis there. So let's call this um, step one. And we basically just do another conj, you know, to take care of this other part that's staying the same. And then we'll use the induction hypothesis to go from rev of, of that to rev of ys append rev of xs. Okay, and so now the, the next thing we need to do is we need to get from this right-hand side, and just to be clear, the order of operations is like that. We need to go from there to this, okay? And to be clear, the order of operations here, it's, um, it's, it's got the parentheses in the other way. Okay. So let's go ahead and put those parentheses in. All right, so if we can prove this second step, then we'll be, then we'll be done because we can then use the transitive rule to put together the two steps. Okay. And then of course, this property here is just the associativity of uh, of append, which is you know you could uh, that's obviously in the uh, standard library. I'm just going to go ahead and paste it in right here. Okay. So we need to do append is associative, and the three lists are. Rev of ys, rev of xs, and x there. 
Cool. And now we're sort of pop, we keep popping the stack. Now we can go back to, uh, you know, reverse of reverse, back to where we started. So now our first step is we can go ahead and use the reverse append uh, property. So we're gonna start, you know, modifying this left-hand side so we can apply the reverse append property to get to here. And actually maybe I could, I could have written it that way to make it more obvious what we're doing, but, um, but reverse of that just simplifies to the singleton right away. So there's our step one. Now step two is we're gonna, now we have something that we can use the induction hypothesis on, okay? Right now that matches this up here. So our step two is we can take this side and be like, okay, we're gonna rewrite that part over to just be XS prime. So there's our step two. And then our very last step is we need to go from this to just having that const on. And that's, that's just the definition of append can handle that. So that's definitional equality, right? So at the very end of the day, we can finish up this proof by doing a bunch of transitives. And there we have it. We have a proof that reverse or reverse of list gives you back the original list. All right, so that's, that's kind of it for um, the basic, sort of the basics of Agda and then Kind of what I want to do next is spend the next like 20 minutes kind of diving into using Agda for programming languages uh, research and, and kind of why I like Agda for that. Okay, so modeling programming languages in Agda. Um, the, the obvious part is that, you know, for the abstract syntax of a programming language, you're going to want to just use a data type. And then, uh, the first sort of interesting question you run into is how to represent variables. There's been lots of debates over the years about how to use variables or how to represent variables. Um, and lots of people will tell you different things. Um, what I have settled on and am quite fond of is good old de Brown representation, but using what I'll call the Scottish school of, of handling the brown variables okay and we're, we're and this comes from uh, Connor McBride and friends uh, up in Scotland so I'm going to kind of tell you a little bit about how that works uh, so if you haven't seen the brown variable representation the idea is that you're going to use a natural number to uh, represent what when which binder your variable refers to. Okay, and you're going to count from inside, you know, you're going to count how far you have to go to get to the binder that you're referring to. So let's look at this little example at the bottom here. We have lambda x, lambda y, y. The y at, down in the body here is referring to the very first lambda. So that means it's going to be a de Brown index zero. And then this one, this x down here, you have to pass one lambda and get to the second lambda. So that's going to be index one. Okay, so that's uh, de Brown representation, uh, just like you could read about in, you know, uh, in like the types and programming languages book, except this next part is where we're going to differ from the types and programming languages uh, book. And instead, we're going to, this is based on a draft paper by Connor McBride called Type Preserving, Renaming, and Substitution except that I'm gonna ignore the type preserving part and just do renaming and substitution. And the point of this trick that Connor and friends came up with is that normally if you're just gonna define substitution using names, then you may, if you're doing that sort of good old fashioned ways, your recursive function is actually gonna be difficult to define in a total language like Agda that puts restrictions on what kind of recursion you can do. 
And so the cool thing about what I'm gonna show you is that it becomes totally straightforward to type this into Agda and have these definitions be accepted as total functions, okay? And the main trick is that instead of focusing on one substitution, we're gonna instead define simultaneous substitution. That is, how do you simultaneously substitute for a whole bunch of variables or maybe all the free variables in a term, substitute them all for some other terms, okay? So that's what we're gonna build up to, right? We're gonna build up to defining this function called sub that takes this simultaneous substitution, which is a function from natural numbers, that is from De Bruyne number indices to terms. And then give me a term that I wanna substitute, apply the substitution to, and then I'll produce the result of substitution. Uh, so for example, you know, if I've got a variable, I can just apply the function sigma to get my result, okay? Uh, but we're not ready yet to look at the rest of that. Okay, so we need some helper functions to do this. And, and the helper function, the helper functions all have to do with how do you transport one of these substitution functions underneath a lambda? Okay, so like, let's say I have a substitution function that lives in a world up here where the de Brown indices all have a certain meaning. And then I wanna transport that function underneath one more lambda. And the problem is, is that when you go underneath a lambda, all your de Bruyne indices need to add one, right? Because now you're further away from where you used to be, okay? And so that's kind of uh, a problem to deal with. Um, and so we're gonna define this x, x function to deal with that, okay? Um, and so let's think about what this does. Well, what if we have De Bruyne index zero down here underneath the lambda? What should we do with zero? Well, zero is bound by this lambda. And so we shouldn't do anything with it, right? This is capture avoiding substitution, right? We're not, you know, we're not supposed to mess with the bound variables. So zero should be should stay zero, okay? Fine. What about the bigger numbers, the bigger De Bruyne indices like one or two or three? Well, that's a number down here in this world. We're gonna wanna invoke, we're gonna wanna call sigma, but to do that, we need to sort of bounce back up into the world where sigma lives by subtracting one. So we can go from successor of X to just X, so that's subtracting one. We can then apply sigma. And now we have a term. And so we've got a term that lives up here and we need to transport the term underneath the lambda, which means that all the, the free variables in that term need to be incremented by one, okay? And so that's what this renaming function is gonna do for us, okay? We haven't defined it yet, we need to, but we're gonna be able to rename all the variables by adding one to them. Right? So the successor function is just you know, the add one function. And so in general, rename will take a function from, from variables to variables or natural numbers to natural numbers and apply that function to a term in a way that's, you know, respects, it just does it to the free variables and not the bound variables. Okay. Oh, I need to get the chat client back up again. Okay. All right, so how do we define rename? So the rename function is gonna look a lot, a lot like the sub function. And you might be a little bit worried that like when we go to, to enter this clause for rename, that we, you know, we're gonna need another thing like X. And then what, how on earth are we gonna deal with that? Like, are, are, are we gonna keep having turtles all the way down? And the, the, the answer is we sort of luck out and, and we're, we're good. Okay, so let's go back up. Now we've got rename. Rename takes a natural to naturals function and term to term. Okay, so for the variable case, we just apply row to the variable. That gives us a number, and then we just you know need to make it a term. So we say, okay, that's a variable. Okay, the interesting case is lambda, where we need to transport our row 
so that it makes sense underneath the lambda. So we need this helper function x that's a lot like the x to s function uh, that we went through before. Again, zero needs to go to zero. Okay, but let's see what happens for the, the one or higher case. And this is where we sort of get lucky. Okay, so we're, all we need to, we've got a, a number coming in and all we need to do is produce a number, okay? So again, we subtract one from, from this to get X, feed that into rho, and then we need to transport that number, that De Bruyne index back underneath the lambda. We can do that just by doing add one by successor, okay? So, so it's straightforward to implement X for renaming just as so, and we are good to go. We have a perfectly good recursive definition here. It's doing recursion. You know, the, the, the term is always getting smaller, even though our, you know, we're doing all kinds of changes to row, but that's okay. We're not relying on row for the termination argument. We're just purely, this is purely structural recursion on the terms. So that is the Scottish trick for, for how you define substitution. How do you define parallel substitution in a way that's sort of friendly to, you know, systems like Agda or Coq that want you, you know, to be terminating? Okay. Um, so now we're dealing with simultaneous substitution. Something we need to realize about the simultaneous substitution function is that really, you know, so we've got this function for natural numbers to terms. You can, if you want to, you can think of that as an infinite list of terms. Okay, so I've sort of at the top here, I've written out an infinite list of terms. Okay, and so what is, you know, now we can think of these as stream operators. Okay, so we can define stream operators like cons. It's like, oh, what happens if I cons a term onto an infinite list? Well, we get a slightly longer infinite list. And you can have car and cutter and, and whatnot. So what does car do? It says, give me the, the first element of the stream and cutter, you know, gets rid of the first element and gives you the rest of the stream. And, uh, and then actually here, just one little sample of using cons. Let's say the second argument to cons is just the identity function, right? It just takes zero, one, two, three to the terms, the variables, zero, one, two, three, the free variables. If we cons M onto that, we're gonna get a, you know, we're going to have a substitution that takes zero to M and then everything else is going to subtract one. And that's actually how we're going to build the single substitution function, which, so this sub zero is saying, please substitute term M for the De Bruyne index zero inside of N. Okay. And then, and then subtract one from, from all the other, you know, free variables in N because, you know, N used to be like in a Lambda or something, and now it's no longer, we're getting rid of, you know, we're doing substitution because we're getting rid of a binder, okay? And so that's why you have sort of the minus one over here, right? So we can express this sub zero just as a, um, as, you know, simultaneous substitution where we are literally using this same, this same infinite stream here applied to N. Okay, so that's how you do single substitution. And then now let's do lambda calculus. So this is full beta. So this is like Baron Drex, you know, good old lambda calculus uh, or going further, sorry, that's, this is how you see it in Baron Drex uh, book. Of course, it goes further, way further back than that. Um, so here we've got, you know, this, uh, this rule, this last rule here is giving us, uh, you know, this is operational semantics and it's giving us reduction under Lambda, right? And here we have the beta rule that's doing function application and there's our sub zero, there's our substitution being used there. And um, of course, you know, taking a step back, you know, reduction is a relation, right? And so how do we define relations in Agda with a data type definition? And this is very much a dependent data type uh, because, you know, for example, we're, we're, you know, we've got parameters that are terms coming in and then 
you know, we're indexing our data type with terms and using those uh, in those types. So that's, that's how you would define reduction in the lambda calculus. Maybe also kind of speeding head. You wanna do multi-step reduction, of course. You can, uh, that's just another data type definition, like so. And then, you know, you could then, you know, just like we did with append, you know, you can, you know, the reverse reverse kind of things, you can do proofs about reduction, right? So you could prove that multi-step reduction is transitive. And this proof actually looks a lot like uh, the proof that, a uh, uh, what is it? Oh, this, this proof, multi-step is transitive, it actually looks a lot like just like the append function, okay? Has the same exact structure. And, and we could just prove a lot of these things as by defining, you know, recursive functions. Uh, I'm not going to do that. Uh, it would just be sort of more of the same. I want to sort of give you a little bit of taste of some slightly more complex proofs that you might want to you might want to do in Agda. Uh, like maybe you wanted to prove confluence of the lambda calculus. Okay. Or maybe you wanted to prove something using a logical relation uh, in Agda, and you can certainly do that. And when you get into these sort of more advanced proofs, you're often gonna need some fairly sophisticated properties of substitution, okay? That are sort of well-known properties of substitution, but they're kind of a pain to prove. And so here's, here's one of those properties, which is that the simultaneous substitution function commutes with the single substitution function, right? So if you have sub and then sub zero, you can sort of push the sub underneath the sub zero. So, so you get sub zero at the top and then the sub sigma on M goes inside and then the sub also goes inside N, but we have to sort of augment the sigma a little bit. We have to, because N really makes sense in a, it sort of assumes that there's sort of a scope for de Brown zero there. And so we have to do the usual X kind of thing to say, don't mess with, don't mess around with De Bruyne index zero. We basically need to shift sigma up to ignore that. Okay, so this kind of property is, is standard, but it's also kind of tedious to prove it. You know, it probably would take on the order of, you know, a few hundred lines of Agda uh, to prove that property, you know, and it would take dozens of, dozens of lemmas and stuff like that. And so every time you define a new programming language, which we do all the time, you're gonna be proving all these substitution lemmas again, which is a total pain in the neck, okay? So we don't wanna do that. Instead, what we want is maybe some kind of framework to sort of prove our, so that we can sort of prove these substitution lemmas once and for all. And there, there are some frameworks like this for cock out there. Um, and, and I've built one in particular for Agda and I kind of want to show off the one for Agda that I've built and, and show how it uses dependent types in a way that sort of, that I don't know how to do it if I don't have the dependent types. Like I don't know how to do this in uh, this framework in Isabel, for example. So, and this is gonna be kind of the last thing we talk about today is something called abstract binding trees. And so this is uh, an idea that I learned about from Robert Harper's Practical Foundations of Programming Languages book. He has sort of a pen and paper presentation of how you think about abstract binding trees. And what I'm gonna show you here is a formalization in Agda of abstract binding trees. And the basic idea is that these are a lot like good old abstract syntax trees, except that they know about binding, they know about variables, okay? And, they, and you can define substitution on these things. And you can also think about, if you come from a scheme or racket background or Lisp, you could think about these things as S expressions. So these particular abstract binding trees are gonna be language agnostic, okay? 
So here you can see that my abstract binding tree data type has variables in it. We're gonna say you everybody has to have variables. And then we're just gonna have this arbitrary node in your abstract syntax tree. It's gonna be this node constructor, okay? So this is gonna, every language has abstract syntax tree nodes. And then the way we're gonna make this abstract binding tree language specific is with these parameters, these module parameters, op and sig. So op says, what are all the different kinds of nodes for your language, okay? And then sig says, for each of those operators, for each of the kinds of nodes in your language, what is the arity? And furthermore, for each sub-expression, how many new binding variables are you introducing? Okay, so that's what the sig op says, okay? And then, so what's going on here is that each node has says, oh, I've got an operator to say what kind of node I am. And then I have my sub-expressions, which is basically a list, but it's indexed by this list of numbers, okay? And so if we get down into here, if you've got an empty list, well, that just better be a nil. And if, if you've got an actual number, B, that number tells you, B tells you how many variables are being coming into scope for this one argument that's an ABT. Uh, David's asking, how are abstract binding trees related to higher order abstract syntax? That's a great question. They're, they're two different approaches to solving the, well, actually, I was about to say solving the same problem, but that's not quite true. So you could do abstract binding trees using higher order abstract syntax, I believe, because higher order abstract syntax is how you deal with the variables, okay? Here, the, the fact that I put the number N, the natural, natural numbers as my, my variables, means I'm committing to using de Brown indices for this ABT library. But I suppose it's possible to instead of using de Brown indices, you could use higher order abstract syntax for your ABT library. I suppose that's possible. I haven't tried it though. So that's just, I, it's sort of orthogonal issues here. How do you deal with variable binding? How do you sort of deal with, you know, you know your abstract syntax trees? Um, okay, so now, you say, okay, now fine, I've got abstract binding trees, but how do I do the lambda calculus? So I needed to find some ops. So what are my different terms in my lambda calculus? Well, I've got lambda terms and I've got application, I've got variables. The variables are already taken care of, so we just need lambda and application. So that's why we have lamb and app here as, as two operators. And then we have to define this signature function that says, okay, for lambda, how many sub-expressions does it have? So that's how many elements of the list they're gonna be. So it's just gonna be one element in this list. And that one element in the list needs to tell me how many variables are in my binding. And lambda has one binder in it, right? So that's why there's a one. Application has two sub-expressions. So this list has is length two, but there's no binders being introduced with application. So it's zero and zero there. Okay. And then I can, you know, now I can do my, I can use my abstract binding tree library to import uh, my abstract syntax trees. And then, and then I can define some patterns so that I can use like better notation for creating these AST nodes. Okay. Getting low on time. Um, David, is it okay if I go for maybe five more minutes? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. So fine, I've got my abstract binding tree. And so now the idea is I'm gonna replay the story about how you do substitution, but instead of doing it for just the Lambda calculus, now I can say, oh, how do you do substitution for abstract binding trees? And the answer is it's pretty straightforward. Um, you basically do the same thing, okay? One minor thing is that instead of 
you know, if in, you know, in this abstract binding tree library, you can have not just one binder, but many binders being introduced at the same time, maybe because you want functions that can take multiple parameters instead of just one parameter like the lambda calculus. And so we have a version of the ext function that, that iterates uh, multiple times, right? So we have that, but once you have that, we can define renaming, uh, and then we can define substitution and we're good to go. So now we have substitution defined once and for all for our abstract binding trees. And that means we also have substitution defined for the Lambda calculus. We just have to import you know, the ABT library and we now have this substitution function. Um, but it gets better because we can prove this lemma, this sort of gnarly, annoying lemma about commuting substitutions. We can prove that lemma once and for all for the abstract binding trees. And then this lemma, we can use it, we just have to import this lemma and we can use it as is on our Lambda calculus terms that we got from, you know, also importing from the ABT library. Uh, and so that is, that's sort of the climax is that, uh, is that this ABT, you know, this definition of abstract binding trees that I've given here, very crucially depends on dependent typing on the way the sig function is being used and this arguments thing. And, and so it, what it's allowing you to do is it's allowing you to take sort of this sort of soup or universe of, of arbitrary S expressions, some of which don't make sense for the lambda calculus. And if you plug in the right parameters for op and sig, like I've done here, what comes out is now the abstract binding trees that only correspond to our lambda calculus, and that's it. And, and then we get to import all of our substitution functions, all of our lemmas, and we don't have to prove those ever again. Um, and so that's, that's why I like dependent types <laughs> uh, and why I'm currently you know, still using uh, Agda and haven't gone back to Isabel. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's it. That's uh, just kind of a conclude. What are the high points here to remember? Agda is a proof assistant that kind of embraces Curry Howard, right? Doing all those proofs was really just writing recursive functions, okay, to do your induction. Uh, one thing that's nice about Agda is that it is relatively easy to learn for people who are familiar with functional programming. Uh, I think for many students in Europe, that's the case. Unfortunately, in the US, most of the students here do not learn functional programming. And so it's a, it's a bit difficult to use Agda in sort of introductory courses here in the US. Um, the other takeaway points is that using the Brown indices with simultaneous substitution is a great way to formalize variables if you're doing programming languages uh, research. Uh, I like it better than locally nameless. Uh, I like it better than just using plain old names. I like it better than nominal. Um, uh, so I've I've tried out some or I've tried out most of those to varying degrees. I've tried locally nameless quite a bit. And what I like about this approach is that I that after I've got all my substitution lemmas proved, I can mostly forget about variables and move on to thinking about other more important things, uh, which is which is exactly where I want to be. And so the final point there is that dependent types allow us to uh, define these abstract binding trees that can free us from the tedium of reasoning about variables and proving substitution numbers. All right, so that's it. Maybe take some final questions. Maybe we can go fully oral for this final set of questions. Does that sound good, David? That's good. So, so how does it work with, um, when you're defining relations in, in Agda and, mm -hmm. and you're defining a small step operational semantics, can you then kind of make it executable, you know, running running the steps or, or export it like you can do it with functions in, in Coq or Isabel and export export them to you can actually run them? How do you yes, absolutely. Yeah, so in the book, uh, uh, the uh, PLFA book, actually, maybe I can go ahead and pull it up. Uh, uh, here we go. 
So at the very end of the day, David, here's this eval function. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it uh, you give it how many steps of execution you want to take. And then it will go ahead and produce that many steps. And, and this steps is basically a log of all the reduction rules that you used. Mm -hmm. uh, and and this, this eval is, is just a good old function. So you could literally run this. And so like, and here's like an example. So let's say um, you want to run, um, I guess, what is this? Uh, this is the this is sort of an infinite <laughs> sequence here. <laughs> it's just going to keep you know going forever, adding one to itself. Uh, and so here's like the first three steps of that infinite sequence of reductions. And you can see we're just keeping building up more and more successor of successor of of mu of <laughs> successor of of yourself. Yeah. Uh, here's a less weird example of applying the church normal two uh, to a uh, successor in zero. And of course, producing uh, the number two. Uh, and you can see here, it's, it's spit out the reduction sequence as a result of evaluation here. That's nice. Get a good debugging. Mm -hmm. Also understand. Let's see here. So I think Victor asked two questions now in the chat. Uh, uh, if you want more, uh, okay, so this is going back to, let's go back to uh, this abstract syntax tree. It looks, looks like a great question here. Um, the question is, let's get, this ABT thing. It is, if you want additional data in your AST, not just other nodes, and, and maybe I would explicitly like other sub-expressions, uh, where would you put those, uh, that other data? And, and indeed, Victor, you're correct that you can put that data in these op constructors here, okay? So, so you could add, you know, for, you know, argument, you know, parameters to this constructor, and then those, and then that data is going to go along for the ride inside the op here, part of your node. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so here, like instead of just op lamb, you could have op something, and then more more data sort of as part of that constructor. Okay, and then. And then Victor says, how, how does this interact with multiple types in an AST, such as system F, where the bindings go between, like you'd have, and I can sort of uh, sort of explain this a little bit more. Let's say you have, like in system F, you've got type annotations. So you've got parts of your terms that are actually types, and there's, you, know, you need a sort of an abstract syntax for your types. And furthermore, your types have binders, you have your type variables, and so you have multiple different binding types running around. And so that's a great question. The, um, this abstract binding tree library that I've got defined right now does not explicitly deal with having different kinds of binders and different kinds of terms, okay? So this is, is a weakness of, of this abstract binding tree library. That being said, there are some ways of dealing with this. Uh, yeah, and one is exactly as you're saying, Victor, is that you could just merge the two grammars of, for types and terms together and merge the two different kinds of variables into one kind of variable, and then have a, like you said, a well-formedness definition or build it into your well-typedness definition that would, make sure that the type variables are treated like types and the term variables are treated like terms and, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, and so that's actually something that I'm doing some experimentation with to see how feasible is that approach or do I really need to sort of make the abstract binding tree library more complicated by adding explicit support for different 
kinds of, uh, for different kinds of bindings and for sort of mutually recurs or having different kinds of terms as well. So that's kind of a current area of research for me is figuring out what sort of the, what's sort of viable or what's the best way to do things in AGDA in that regard. Um, so yeah, good question. So, I mean, in some sense, what you should take away from that is that this ABT library, you know, are, can you do cutting edge PL research with it? Maybe, maybe not, depending on what language you're dealing with. Uh, and uh, so that's definitely, you know, you'd want to take that into consideration. Uh, um, and I, I, I think it's uh, also maybe to point out that other people are are doing sort of trying out their own variations on this kind of thing and and uh, experimenting with different approaches. So great, thanks, mm -hmm. thank you again. Um, so if there are no uh, more questions, I maybe we should um, close this uh, great uh, great lecture and. Um, and uh, now everybody knows everything about Agda, which is great. Uh, <laughs> I think it was a, a great, great introduction. Thanks again. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you, David. My pleasure. <laughs>